Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ogenyi, for a generous uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Neuroradiology Society of North, I mean, Neuroradio Society of Nigeria uh, for invitation. It's really an honor. So in the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to take you through pediatric lipodystrophy. Uh, I'm trying to make things easy, uh, like um, how to uh, uh, early diagnose these uh, pediatric patients based on uh, clinical presentation and uh, imaging patterns. I have no any relevant financial disclosure or conflict of interest. Yeah. So uh, um, at the end of this talk, I expect us uh, uh, to know uh, the common uh, like a clinical presentation. I mean the clinical presentation in the MRI patterns of the uh, leukodystrophy and uh, to know exactly the classic MRI uh, patterns of the common leukodystrophies. And for those leukodystrophies, which doesn't have this uh, 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 characteristic imaging findings, at least to have uh, a, a gamut based of differentials. This is my outline. This is my presentation outline. Uh, I'll quickly uh, talk about uh, the normal patterns and progression of myelination, uh, then give a, 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 a clue about the background of classifications of leukodystrophy, and then we'll dwell on the case-based review of the uh, uh, childhood leukodystrophies based on the cases of which uh, um, we encountered in our setting for the past three years, and with these cases, they have uh, uh, a proof of genetic testing, like they were genet genetically approved, and also some cases from the literature. So uh, this will be my presentation outline. Uh, so I'll start with uh, uh, myelination. Uh, I think it's crucial to know, uh, like the progression of myelination, uh, so as not to um, confuse it with pathology in pediatric patients. So uh, myelination uh, in infants is having a different uh, pattern for adult, and it occurs in predictable and organized fashion based on correct gestational age. So for instance, a child born at 32 weeks of gestation and presents at two months of life for MRI imaging, uh, I mean, it's myelination in the MRI image will be equivalent to a full-term newborn and uh, uh, this one is evaluated in T1 and T2 MRI sequences, and uh, myelination progression corresponds to the developmental milestones. So uh, what's myelin composed of? So oligodendrocytes are responsible for myelin production and maintenance, and, and the astroastrocytes, they can also uh, have a composition in the myelin production, but uh, as less compared to oligodendrocytes. Then the myelin uh, wraps around tightly around the axon, um, and then this forms an integral for a nerve con for a conduction. So what myelin composed of? 70 to 80% are lipids and 20 to 30% are proteins. So the composition of myelin is, the, is, the, is something which forms, a, 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 I mean, I mean uh, forms the, uh, um, like the study of progression of myelin on T1 and T2. So like uh, the uh, um, myelination, uh, it's best studied early in the T1 weighted MRI image because the presence of lipid and proteins results in T2 shortening. During this time, there is a little effect on T2 weighted MRI uh, in this, in concerning myelination. And as the time goes on, because there is a movement of water molecules from the myelin to the extracellular meaning interstitial compartment, then this is starting showing in the situated MRI image. So uh, here uh, we have like uh, um, anatomical structures in the, in the brain, which help us to know, which acts as a landmark to study for progression of myelination. So here at the top row, we have T2-weighted MRI image. And then at the bottom, we have T1-weighted MRI image. So at two, in two to three months of age, there is a um, hypointense signal at the, the bilateral dentate nucleus, at, like at the uh, dentate hilus. 
And then at uh, uh, four months of age, you can see there is a, a, a myelination at the, vent at, at the dorsal brainstem while the uh, ventral brainstem is still hyper intense. And then at six months of age, you can see there is a, a myelination or the splenium of the corpus callosum. And then at eight months of age, that is myelination uh, uh, appear at the chain of the corpus callosum. And at um, um, I mean, 11, at 11 months, that's when you can start seeing on T2 myelination at the anterior limb of the internal capsule. And at 12 to uh, 13 months, that's when you can see myelination at the uh, um, centrum semiovale and corona radiata being the frontal deep white matter. So uh, what we see uh, regarding myelination at birth, so um, on T1, we can see there is myelination at the dorsal uh, brainstem, posterior limb of internal capsule, and periolandic cortex. And on T2 weighted MRI image, there is myelination only at the dented hilus. And the relative subtle myelination at the ventrolateral thalami and periolandic cortex. And uh, also at the uh, dorsal brainstem. So you can clearly see like uh, you can delineate uh, ventral and dorsal brainstem. So this is myelination at birth. So uh, in two months of age, you can see uh, there is a, a, a myelination extending to involve the posterior limb of internal capsule and periolandic cortex on t weighted MRI. And then you can see there is a fully myelination of the dented nucleus in the posterior cranial fossa. And then there is a fully myelination at the ventrolateral thalami and relative subtle myelination at the periolandic cortex. And at four months of age, uh, you can see myelination in T1 extends now to the anterior limb of internal capsule, periolandic cortex, and corona radiata. And then on T2 weighted MRI, you can see now there is a, a myelination involving both the T2, I mean the ventral and dorsal brainstem, and also a posterior limb of internal capsule now is start myelinating. And such a myelination on T2 at the uh, junction of the corona radiata and centrum semiovale. And at six months of age, you can see there is myelination at the splenium of the corpus callosum and uh, a confluent myelination at the corona radiata and centrum semiovale. And also there is myelination at the genu of the corpus callosum. Now on T2, you can see there is uh, the splenium of the corpus callosum now starts myelination and also the periolandic cortex. At eight months of age, you can see like uh, the uh, on T1 weighted MRI, almost the adult brain pattern is achieved, being there is a, a, a myelination at the genu of the corpus callosum, splenum of the corpus callosum, both anterior and posterior limb of internal capsule, and centrum semiovale and corona radiata. And then there is, a, a, at eight months, there is a on T2 weighted MRI, there is a myelination at the genu of the corpus Callosum and uh, relative subtle myelination starting now at the uh, uh, centrum semiovale junction and corona radiata. At 10 months of age, uh, you can see like uh, the T in T1 weighted imaging, like there is the uh, adaption of an adult brain uh, pattern of myelination. And, on, and then on T2, you can see there is myelination involving the uh, posterior, I mean anterior limb of the internal capsule, and then a uh, junction of corona radiata and central semiovale. And at 12 months of age, you can now see uh, there is myelination of the uh, splenum of the corpus callosum on T2, um, uh, genu of the corpus callosum, corona radiata and central semiovale. So like uh, uh, studying the progression of myelination in T1 is good up to one month of age while starting from uh, one to two months of age, situated MRI is the best in studying the progression of myelination. So in two years, uh, on situated MRI, it is almost uh, uh, adopting the adult pattern of myelination, where we can see confluent, like a myelination of the centrum semiovale, corona radiata, anterior, I mean, uh, anterior posterior limb of internal capsule and the uh, splenium and genu of the corpus callosum. While uh, the uh, uh, temporal uh, white matter delays myelination and 
times, at times it, it is also termed as a terminal zone of myelination, where myelination can uh, continue and occur up to after two years of age. So uh, I also want to talk about these terminal zones of myelination. So as in our daily practice, not to confuse them with pathology in the setting of pediatric patients. So uh, um, terminal myelination uh, occurs in the uh, um, periatrial white matter, uh, the temporal frontal subinsular uh, subcortical white matter, uh, where they occur like a, a, a abnormal hyperintense signal uh, in these areas. So why are we bothered knowing our uh, terminal zones of myelination? It is important to know about terminal zones of myelination uh, in the setting of pediatric patients so that not to uh, uh, mistake them with pathology. So this is a good example. Like here on the left, we have uh, 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 I mean a, a patient imaged for, uh, with showing terminal zones of myelination. So you can clearly see there is like a linear hypointense signal in between the regular marginated uh, um, uh, lateral ventricle and this uh, hyperintense uh, uh, signal in the uh, left uh, uh, periventricular white matter, as opposed in patient in pediatric patients with per periventricular lipomalacia, where you cannot see this uh, um, I mean hypointense signal in between the uh, borders of the ventricle and uh, white matter, and also if you can see here the uh, the margins, the margins of the ventricle, they are irregular and not uh, well marginated as in this case of the terminal zones of myelination. So this is the clue in differentiating between terminal zones of myelination and the child with periventricular leukomalacia. <laughs> so what are the leukodystrophies? These leukodystrophies are inherited disorders where the genetic uh, defect results in enzymatic deficiency, which leads to the um, absence of a potential um, uh, enzyme or the accumulation of uh, toxic metabolites uh, uh, to the level of uh, reaching that uh, amino enzymatic deficiency. Uh, so in the uh, there, there are various classification in re with regarding to lipodystrophy. Uh, they were classified uh, like a, based on the energy source or organelle involved, like lysosomal disorders, clinical features or organs affected, adrenal lipodystrophy, eponyms related to discovery, Alexander disease, char characteristic MRI features like megalencephalic leukoencephalopathy with subcortical cysts, or they can be classified can based on specific enzymatic or genetic defect. So in the past, there, was a, there were a lot of class, classification based on this lipodystrophy, and this was based on the knowledge of uh, 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 scientists uh, based on these processes by then. And currently, there is a recent proposed classification, and it was published by Van de Knapp and, and colleagues in 2017. And uh, I propose uh, for those who have interest in pediatric lipodystrophy to go and review uh, this article. It is terrific free. So here, Van de Knapp and colleagues, they uh, are classified lipodystrophies based on the myelin disorders like hypomyelination, demyelination, vacuolization, astropathies, leukoaxonopathies, microgliopathies, and leukovaculopathies. So, so today, I, I will not dwell on this classification. But um, I urge those who have interest in pediatric leukodystrophy to go and review this article. So the current definition of leukodystrophy is all genetically determined disorder primarily affecting central nervous system white matter, irrespective of structural white matter components involved, the molecular process affected, and the disease cause. So what is the clinical presentation. These leukodystrophies are the common causes of developmental arrest in children. And uh, there is a great variation, uh, depends on age, and also within the uh, same uh, type of leukodystrophy, and uh, also uh, based on different leukodystrophies. But these patients, they can also present with seizures, macrocephaly, hypotonia, and impaired vision and hearing. Uh, so, um, early detection and treatment is the key to improve outcomes of this. Uh, uh, and many disorders are not as many 
these orders are alcohol that are not free, but some if they, they be uh, they did early, they can be managed with dietary modifications like maple syrup, urine disease, or fetal kidney urea, medication, supplements, cell or organ transplantation, like in the case of hepatic failure and Zellweger syndrome. Uh, so what is the most common clinical presentation in neonates? These patients with lipodystrophy, they are fairly normal at birth, and then they can subsequently uh, decline hours, weeks, months after birth. And this uh, uh, pattern of um, uh, presenting with neurological decline distinguishes them from hypoxic ischemic injury because the child with uh, I mean, patients, uh, pediatric patients with hypoxic ischemic injury, they, they are born with neurological deficit. So the common neonatal presentation is developed to life and also pre-alkalosis, hyperammonemia, and, and uh, uh, neuro, I mean, non neuro organ failure. And in childhood, there is a var variability of uh, uh, presenting uh, among the leukodystrophies themselves. Uh, the certain leukodystrophy or different leukodystrophies. And uh, they can sometimes with physiological symptoms, which can be progressive or static, but commonly they do present with motor and cognition deficits. Seizures, they are common in childhood because now the uh, involvement is predominantly in the white man, not in the cortex. But seizures, they do happen, but not, not commonly as, as common as in neonates. And the children are normal uh, prior to presentation. So now we'll come uh, to the view of the uh, uh, cases of which uh, uh, I will review case, and then uh, I'll try to uh, place these cases based on the uh, uh, patterns and clinical presentation, so, so as to, for us to be able to quickly uh, pick this. Uh, 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 For this engine. Involving the junction of the and the contact of the dystrophies, which in which the Neonates they are present with uh, uh, the disorders of amino acid metabolism. In here, we have maple syrup, urine disease, and non ketotic hyperglycemia. These, these are disorders prevention involve the uh, myelinated white matter, and they present with intramyelinic. So, talking about. So, in here, this in cartoon diagram here, here. We can see these ones are the axons and neurons uh, with myelin, and uh, these are white dots with arrows. These are the uh, water molecules, and the yellow, the yellow uh, rounds uh, structures. With severe progressive neurological deterioration, and then the characteristic, the characteristic uh, finding, hence the name, is the presence of sweet smelling odor in view in urine, hence the name maple syrup. So what what do we see on imaging? On imaging, we see there is extensive intramyelinic edema involving the early myelinated uh, white matter areas. As in here, we can see there is myelinated. I mean, there is a, a reduced uh, diffusion in the. Uh, I mean, in the um, white matter of the cerebellar hemisphere, being the brachium pontus and the corticospinal tract. And here we can see there is a restricted diffusion involving the bilateral thalamine and internal 
uh, capsule. And then there is also here involving the corona radiata. So when we complement these uh, uh, MRI findings with uh, MRI spectroscopy, then we, we can see characteristic uh, uh, branch chain amino acids at 0 0.9 to 1 parts per million, which is because of the accumulation of uh, isoleucine valine, isoleucine or valine. Another gamut in this differential, which presents with intramyelinic edema on imaging, is non ketotic hyperglycemia. So, like uh, uh, here, enzymatic deficiency results in the buildup of glycine. And these patients, they do present with seizures, dystonia, and pronounced developmental delay. And 80% they do present in neonatal period. So, uh, the classic finding on EEG is a burst suppression where there is a generalized uh, there is a generalized activation uh, which is uh, of uh, the, the delta and uh, and theta activity intermixed with uh, uh, sharp and uh, uh, spike waves which can be which is can last uh, for six minutes followed by a period of suppression of low amplitude which can last for about six minutes I mean, 60 seconds. So this one is the uh, burst, um, burst suppression pattern on EEG, which is characteristic for non-ketotic hyperglycemia. Yeah, so like what do we see on imaging? So you can see there is intramyelinic edema involving the posterior limb of internal capsule, the tegmental tracts at the dorsal medulla. And then also you can see there is thinning of the splendium of, I mean thinning of the corpus callosum. And then there is a characteristic finding a glycine peak at 3.5 to 3.6 parts per million. So the, here is the area where also my myoinocytor resonates in MRI uh, spectroscopy. So it is uh, uh, better to do uh, MRI spectroscopy with long TEs so that to uh, find a peak of uh, a glycine in these patients with non-ketotic hyperglycemia. So another case, uh, this is a nine-year-old male present with macrocephaly syndromic face and developmental delay. So on imaging, you can see there, was, there is a sequela of a, a compromise of a white matter, which results in uh, the atrophy and ex vacuo dilatation of the ventricles. And this child is having macrocephaly. So what are the leukodystrophy which are presenting with macrocephaly? Here we have mucopolysaccharidosis, gangliosidosis type 1 and 2, Zellweger syndrome, Carnarvon disease, Van der Knapp, Alexander, congenital muscular dystrophy, strictly merosine deficiency, and glutaric aciduria type 1. So here, here today we'll discuss all about mucopolysaccharidosis, the common one. Common ones, Carnarvon disease, Van der Knapp, Alexander, and glutaric aciduria. So, what is mucopolysaccharidosis? So, a uh, uh, diagnosis of this uh, uh, pediatric patient is usually suspected based on clinical picture. You find a pediatric patient with macrocephaly, syndromic face, developmental delay, both this dysplasias and uh, joint abnormalities. When you do ultrasound scan, they are having hepatosplenomegaly. And then on, on urine, there, there is characteristic findings of these gly glycosaminoglycans in the urine. What do we see on imaging? On imaging, there is a, a um, classic finding of a, a, a dilated perivascular spaces predominantly adjacent to the corpus callosum. And then when we do spine uh, uh, imaging, we can find this gibbous deformity and inferior beaking of the vertebral body. And uh, on a sagittal, I mean, sagittal MRI image, we can find inverted J-shaped cellar and then hypoplastic dense. And we can also find a, a, a hypertrophy of the ligaments at the cranial uh, cervical junction, which is causing compression or at the uh, cranial cervical Junction. So in the uh, in here we have uh, four types of which are Hala, Hunters, uh, San Filippo, and Moquio. And the commonly uh, uh, types of uh, 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 mucopolysaccharidosis who are presenting with dilated bifurobin space are Hala and Hunters. Another uh, leukodystrophy which presents with a uh, uh, um, uh, I mean patients presents with macrocephaly is Carnarvon's disease. So enzymatic deficiency, where the, the enzyme aspartyl acyclate is deficient, 
results in an acumulation of n acetyl aspartate in the blood urine and TNS. So this can typically manifest in the first years of life with macrocephaly, hypotonia, spasticity, and, and seizures. So what do we see on imaging? We can see there is an extensive like compromise of the white matter, which appears to be too bright on T2 and too dark on T1. And you can see there is an early involvement of the subcortical U fibers. And also there is an involvement of the um, a basal ganglia, specifically the thalami and a global pallidae. And what a characteristic finding in MRI spectroscopy is peak of NAA at two uh, uh, parts per million. Another uh, uh, difference the uh, pediatric patients presenting with uh, uh, macrocephaly is a uh, megalencephalic leukoencephalopathy with subcortical cyst. This is also called Van Dyckner disease. In where that there is extensive like compromise of the white matter in the setting where the child is presenting with mild symptoms. So what do we see on imaging? We see extensive compromise of white matter extending to involve the subcortical U fibers. And then there is this characteristic uh, finding of cysts like in the anterior temporal lobes, which are uh, uh, mimic arachnoid cysts. The common location is anterior temporal lobe, but uncommon you can also find this cyst in the uh, uh, photo lobes. Another uh, uh, Leukodystrophy which you, in which a, a pediatric patient presents with macrocephaly is Alexander disease. This one is also called fibrinoid leukodystrophy, where the deposition of lofensal fibers results in the destruction of oligodendrons. This child they typically presents in the first years of life with macrocephaly, hypotonia, developmental delay. So on H and E, of which, which radiologists we are not are conversant, they are deposition of rosenthal fiber. So this, as radiologists, we don't see this. So what do we see? So what do we see on imaging? We see a, a, a child presenting with psychomotor delay, uh, having uh, macrocephaly and frequent vomiting. And on imaging, we see there is um, uh, extensive white matter uh, compromise and extending to involve the subcortical U fibers with frontal predominance. And, on, uh, and then on T2 and T1 weighted image, we can see this characteristic like a uh, uh, cyst adjacent to the anterior horns of the uh, lateral ventricles, where they do have uh, a halo of hyperintense signal on T2 and hyperintense signal on T1. So when we give contrast to these patients with Alexander disease, there is characteristic enhancement at the periventricular region. So don't forget to give contrast in pediatric patients on which you suspect lipodystrophy so that they can help you narrow a differential diagnosis and then assist in the neuro, pediatric neurologist to tag, to, I mean, to, um, to, I mean for, for tag to request targeted biochemical and genetic testing, as uh, it has been shown in this case of uh, Alexander disease. And then uh, the, another uh, um, lipodystrophy where the uh, uh, patient pre presents with macrocephaly is glutaric aciduria type 1. Uh, the enzymatic uh, uh, deficiency results in the accumulation of glutaric acid. And these children, they are um, under age of uh, two years. They present with macrocrania, hypotonia, uh, and uh, also, also choreacetosis. And then their prognosis is dismal, and uh, always the, uh, mm, the extension of the uh, encephalopathy is preceded by stress, such as surgery uh, or infection, and less likely and uh, uncommonly trauma. So what do we see on imaging? On imaging, we see there is a, a um, compromise of uh, um, white matter, extends also the subcortical U fibers, commonly involving the parietal and frontal. And then we can find hyperintense signal involving the corpus striatum, being the caudate and putamina. And uh, also, like uh, because of the uh, um, there is no uh, um, there, there is no operculation at the frontal temporal region, so you find the silver fissures appears prominent.
Uh, so uh, in this shelter, also you can see like uh, with uh, 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 butaric aciduria, the prominent uh, vicorobin space, and also there is an uh, increased signal involving uh, the basal ganglia. So case number three, a child with developmental delay. We can see there is abnormal flare hyper intense signal involving the uh, centrum semioval and corona radiata, also periventricular white matter with corresponding restricted diffusion uh, de denoting uh, active uh, uh, demyelination. And another case uh, where we have uh, um, extensive abnormal flare hyper intense signal predominantly involving the posterior aspect and sparing the frontal. And on post-contrast image, we see the characteristic like leading edge. So in this gamut of differentials, so these two cases, they don't have differentials, like, uh, but I put them in differentials. So for us, at least when you see these cases, you can uh, you can think of uh, other alucodystrophies of which they can have like a, a pattern of confining early in the early cause of the disease to the white matter and not Subcortical white matter or subcortical euphyba. So, uh, the common leukodystrophy is where there is a, a deep white matter predominance at the early cause of the disease and sparing of the subcortical euphibas, a metachromatic leukodystrophy. In that, the, 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 uh, our case was an X linked the adrenal leukodystrophy plus Krabbe's disease. So metachromatic leukodystrophy is the uh, common leukodystrophy we see. It is seen, is a very common, is seen in the West or also, also in our setup. This is because of the deficiency in aresulfatase uh, enzyme A. And then there are three forms of disorders uh, where late infantile is most common. And then on T2 off layer uh, MRI image, there is this characteristic like a confluent abnormal hyperintense signal involving the uh, uh, deep white matter of the, uh, of the frontal lobe, but there is this characteristic perivenular sparing, sparing and then creating a tigrate pattern. So when you see uh, a pattern like this and uh, uh, where there is a, a confluent uh, like this, it can help you say about the differential diagnosis of a uh, it can it can raise you a lot of uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy, but uh, also in patients with hypomyelination, like Pelizosmus Baca disease, they can help. They can have this kind of pattern, but not. I mean, having this pattern and being in the sense that metachromatic leukodystrophy is very common, like metachromatic leukodystrophy should come first into your mind. So here you can see like characteristic perivenular uh, sparing or tigrate pattern, and there is no, there is a sparing of subcortical U fibers. Okay, another is adrenal leukodystrophy, of which the second case was. This one is strictly X-linked, and uh, it is characterized by the presence of long chain fatty acids, which causes demyelination into the white matter. So there is early involvement of the corpus callosum, and these uh, pediatric patients, they present with hearing uh, and vision loss because of the involvement of the optic radiation and, uh, um, and, uh, um, and uh, tracts for hearing, like uh, 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 lentiform, I mean, like, tracts for hearing. So this one is a six years bo old boy with uh, behavioral and learning difficulties at school. What we see on imaging, there is the abnormal uh, hyper intense signal involving the posterior uh, uh, white matter at the uh, occipital region. And then there is involvement at the parietal region, at the occipital region. Then there is an early extension to involve the uh, uh, corpus callosum and which it is hypo-intense on, on T1. And then on post-contrast images, there is characteristic like uh, uh, three areas, which we have an, a central core of uh, uh, gliosis and skull, and then intermediate area of inflammation of which can uh, enhance also, and then the leading edge of active demyelination. And here it is showing early involvement of the splenium of the corpus callosum. 
So another uh, disease of where there is error sparing of the uh, uh, subcortical white matter is Krabbe's disease. This is also called uh, globoid cell leukodystrophy, where uh, enzymatic deficiency results in the accumulation of uh, globoid cells. The infantile form is most common. This Patients, they present with developmental delay, hypotonia, and myoclonus. So what do we see on imaging? We see there is a, a, a symmetric intense signal involving the uh, uh, basal ganglia, specifically the thalamus. And then we give when we give contrast image, we see there is an enhancement of the cranial nerves, like in this case, the sustainal uh, segment of the trigeminal. Um, and also, we can see there is hypertrophy of the optic nerve, as in this case, there is hypertrophy, symmetric hypertrophy of the uh, pricasmatic segment of the optic nerves. So the low signal intensity of the bilateral thalami, the cranial nerve enhancement in the uh, optic nerve's hypertrophy is very sensitive. Like when you see them, they can they can help you to think of a uh, uh, um, um, Krabbe's disease, and then limit your differential diagnosis and uh, ask the new pediatric neurologist to target their biochemical and genetic testing. But uh, when they are absent, like they, they don't rule out uh, Krabbe's disease. So, like uh, they can uh, in Krabbe's disease, they can be uh, they can it can be early seen in a, a CT scan where uh, there is a, a hyper hyper dense signal involving the bilateral. And in here on T1, you can see there is a hypointense signal involving the dentate hyla, of which it, it is it was confirmed to be edema, and then a layer of uh, um, inter, 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 I mean intermediate la intervening layer of a uh, 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 hypointense uh, uh, dentate nuclei, and then the leading edge of the myelination. And then there are these lipodystrophies, which are presenting a mimic hypoxic ischemic injury on imaging. These are the molybdenum cofactor deficiency, urea cycle disorders, and mitochondrial disorders. So you find like a clear picture like uh, in pediatric patient, like hypoxic ischemic injury, but it actually it is leukodystrophy. So what is molybdenum cofactor deficiency? This is a rare and fatal metabolic disorders. Commonly, uh, the, 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 it presents in neonates and they do present with seizures. This is an example in a late cause or chronic uh, cause of the disease where there is a severe compromise of uh, a sequel of the severe compromise of the white matter. And you can see there is like cystic encephalomalacia. So in the early disease cause, that's when molybdenum cofactor deficiency mimics hypoxic ischemic injury, where you'll have cerebral edema with restricted diffusion at the cortex, and it can be more pronounced in the global pallida and subsalamic nuclei than the hypoxic ischemic injury. And when we interrogate with MRI spectroscopy, there will be significant elevated uh, uh, lactate peak while all other metabolites will be reduced. So this is an example of molybdenum cofactor deficiency in an acute phase. So you can see here there is a, a diffuse cerebral edema are associated with gyro broadening and sulco effacement. And then on T1 weighted image, you can see there is a, a symmetric hyperintense signal involving the um, bilateral thalami to the uh, extent you cannot descend the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And on diffusion restriction, you can see this picture, which resembles hypoxic ischemic injury involving the uh, diffusion restriction involving the cortex and uh, global pallida. And then you can see there is a ponto cerebellar hypoplasia. So in the setting of a pediatric patient, which mi imaging mimics hypoxic uh, ischemic injury, and you find there is a, a cerebellum and ponto uh, um, atrophy and pons atrophy, like molybdenum molybdenum cofactor deficiency should come into your mind. And then when you complement with MR spectroscopy, you can see there is significant rise of lactate peak while all other metabolites are reduced. Another uh, gamut in this differential is urea cycle disorder. There are two types of urea cycle disorder, the proximal and distal one. So here I'll be talking to uh, proximal urea cycle disorders like onithin transcarbamylase, where there is accumulation of um, uh, of ammonia because there is a, a, a like a, um, 
there is like hindering of the urea cycle so that uh, uh, the, uh, there is no uh, the nitrogen cannot be removed outside of the body. So this is an example of a urea cycle disorder, strictly speaking about a proximal urea cycle disorder being only thin transcarbamylase deficiency, where you can see there is a, a abnormal hyperentent signal involving the white matter, strictly involving the perisylvan region, perilorantic cortex, and also subinsular cortex. And restricted diffusion in there are Globi pallidae, of which can also be can also appear uh, necrotic. And then uh, when you interrogate with MRI spectroscopy, there is characteristic like a, a lactate peak. This is not much uh, is not much expected in pediatric patients, and glutamine glutamate peak at 2.2 to 2.4 parts per million, and another glutamate peak at 3.85 3 to 3.6 parts per million. So when you get a picture like this, it can help you to uh, narrow and limit your differential diagnosis to only thin transcarbamylase deficiency or pro proximal rare cycle disorder so that uh, uh, you can uh, uh, um, you can help them at least in an expedition of the, uh, of the diagnosis means that it will be focused in biochemical and genetic testing. Mitochondrial disorder, these are the number of disorder in where there is a, a um, there is a, a like a destroyment of the uh, aerobic respiration, and this leads to uh, accumulation of lactic acid. So in this, we have a leg syndrome, cancer, Miller's, and MERV. Um, so the characteristic on MRI spectroscopy of mitochondrial disorders is the accumulation of lactic acidosis. And here I'll talk only about Legs syndrome. So what is Legs syndrome? <laughs> this one is uh, among the uh, uh, genetically heterogeneous mitochondrial disorders, and it has it is characterized by progressive neuro uh, demyelination, where you find this bilateral symmetric uh, T2 player hyperintern signal involving the corpus striatum. So like when you find uh, in an um, uh, MRI image like flare OT2, where there is abnormal signal involving the corpus striatum, you have to think of Beck syndrome. But also, we saw disease, glutaric aciduria, molybdenum amcofactor factor deficiency, and priopronic acidemia should come into your mind. And then the presentation and other uh, uh, imaging, uh, imaging techniques like MRI spectroscopy can help to differentiate the two. Can help you differentiate them. There will be also periapidactyl gray matter, abnormal hyperintern signal, and also involving the substantia nigra in thalamic, subthalamic nuclei. And on MRS spectroscopy, you will see the characteristic lactic acid peak at 1.3 parts per million. So this, in this patient here, you can see there is a, uh, uh, this is flare uh, image where there is a swelling and High abnormal hyperintern signal involving the caudate and uh, the proximal putamen and uh, bilateral medial thalamus. And then on MRI spectroscopy, lipid lactate peak at 1.3 parts per million when this patient with legs syndrome. Um, another, uh, the last gamut in the differential is those uh, uh, leukodystrophies, which they do present with hypomyelination. In this gamut, we have Pelizelsmus Barker disease, and uh, we have uh, all other tubulinopathies, and also hypomyelination with the atrophy of the basal ganglia and cerebellum. So in here, I'll speak about Pelizelsmus Barker disease and uh, uh, hypomyelination with atrophy of the basal ganglia and cerebellum. So what do we see on imaging? We see ex extensive compromise of the white matter. Like for instance, in, in this T1, weighted MRI, you can see there is this extensive compromise of the white matter to the point that it mimics flare image. And this on this the flare image, it mimics T1 weighted MRI image. This is because of the hypomyelination. And uh, it is important when you find an image like this for the first time in a patient to give uh, a six month follow up so that uh, you review and uh, do imaging alone to see if the pattern is still this or there is a uh, stats of myelination so as to differentiate between hypomyelination and delayed myelination, which is having another differentials, which are not part of the leukodystrophies. So uh, here is a, um, 
a patient uh, of which uh, uh, was having hypomyelination, you can see like the white matter in T1, it is uh, uh, relatively hypo-intense and it is hyper-intense on, on T2. And then this child by this time when they were having this scan here was about six years. And you can see like uh, uh, there is a, a retained signal intensity of the co I mean, a a caudate and a putamen. But when the child reached 16 years, you can see there is extensive, like uh, there is atrophy of the putamen and the loss of the signal and also the caudate. So this one, uh, and also the uh, uh, cerebellum is a uh, uh, atrophic, uh, specifically the verbis. So in the setting where you have hypomyelination, it's atrophy of the basal ganglia and cerebellum, like uh, uh, hypomyelination with atrophy of, and, uh, of the cerebellum and basal ganglia, which is uh, in the spectrum of uh, hypomyelination leukodystrophy, come into your mind. And then uh, this is not uh, uh, in any gamut of differential, but I thought it is worth knowing. This is Menkes disease or kinky hair syndrome. This one is a rare uh, lipodystrophy, and uh, uh, there is uh, involvement of many enzymes due to copper because of copper deficiency. And this patient presents with the uh, neurodegeneration, and because there is involvement of many enzymes, so, so they can present uh, uh, also with uh, hepatic encephalopathy. So it is not abnormal to find uh, in this child with a uh, Menkes disease, like a deposition of a, a manganese in the basal ganglia. So what do we see on imaging? They have bilateral subdural hygromas, uh, cerebral and cerebellar atrophy. They also have tortuous intracranial vessels and warmian bones involving the lambda and lambdoid suture. And the characteristic fragile hair or kinky's hair, hence the name kinky's hair syndrome. So what do we see on imaging? So we see there is subdu bilateral subdural effusion. We know that they are subdural because we can see displacement of these cortical vessels. Uh, uh, I mean, displacement of these cortical vessels in here. And then on a uh, uh, um, volume rendered MRI angel, you can see there is characteristic electricity of intracranial vessels. And uh, volume rendered CT, there are numerous warmian bones. Uh, in the lambda and in the lambda suture and lambda. The last is the uh, uh, vanishing white matter disease. This is also called cerebellar ataxia with a uh, 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 CNS hypomyelination. Uh, uh, these patients, they do present with progressive ataxia and spasticity and symptoms worsen after traumatic or infectious insult. So what do we see on imaging? We see like uh, uh, extensive compromise of the white matter on T2, which suppresses completely on flare. And then we see these radio strands, these radio strands of preserved parenchyma causing through the uh, compromised white matter. So this one is the characteristic finding and there is also like sparing of the cortex. So this one is the characteristic finding in uh, vanishing white matter. Disease. So in summary, early diagnosis and treatment is essential in maximizing outcomes for children with metabolic lipodystrophies. And imaging plays a key role in the wake up because like early uh, limited uh, radiological diagnosis will aid the pediatric neurologist to do targeted biochemical, biochemical and uh, 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 genetic testing. And don't, don't forget to, uh, to, to, to to MRI spectroscopy and also not to uh, ask for contrasted study when in the setting where you think uh, there is a, a trend, I mean, there is a, a dystrophy. Therefore, it is important to be able to recognize classic imaging features of common or characteristic dystrophy in the children. And then if you don't see those classic imaging features, at least to have a gamut-based approach for cases with non-specific imaging features. So before I wrap up, I just want to acknowledge uh, my dear teachers um, who are the uh, faculties of uh, Radiology School Society of North America, specifically those with, with uh, uh, pediatric interest, Professor Risto Filippi, uh, Hamant Parma, Sandeep Nayak, uh, Pejman Maralani. 
And also, I just want to uh, thank uh, my teachers, Dr. Mephis Mango, who was the coordinator uh, when I was, uh, when we were, me and my colleague, we started the, uh, 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 a neuro uh, rad pro fellowship here in uh, Muhat. And also Dr. Mboka um, Jacob, who was and still the head of department since we, we, were, we were in the neuro um, fellow program. And also uh, this uh, um, Dr. William O'Brien, who is who works in the Cincinnati Pediatric Children's Hospital in Ohio. His tweets and uh, um, our webinars really helped me a lot and still helping me in uh, uh, understanding a little bit about pediatric neuroradiology. Last but not least, with all due respect, I do want to thank my mentor, Professor uh, Frank Jaffet Ninja, uh, who in reality, I, can, I always call him the pearl of this nation because of his determination and tireless efforts to make sure that uh, the radiologists have specialities, they're initiated and uh, uh, they are commenced and like progressing and produce good graduates here in Tanzania. I'll always thank him and may all. May God bless him always. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions.